stood uh, in the home. So that was, I guess, I guess he was uh, going to bed. Do you have any more on that? Is that all they have on it? Okay. So that was March the 13th. John Stewart in the home. That's all I have on that. After much uh, thought and consideration and all that I got from reading, has been postponed. We're not canceling it. We're just postponing it to a later date. And uh, we're still looking forward to seeing it explode. But we don't know what the date will be. But we're just waiting until all of this uh, coronavirus here is over with. Hopefully, hopefully that will be soon. But we have to talk with everyone and consider everything. We decided that we would postpone it for the time being. So I have a note here that if you'd like to give the editorial work for truth for today, well, when he does hold up meaning that that would still be what uh, we would ask for you to do on the last day of the meeting. Our potluck luncheon, uh, I guess we we'll still have it uh, Sunday, March the 22nd. Yeah. I see no reason to not have it. Girl team was today.
We pray that you'll look over them and help them and to be your will and the things that they need. Be with us, Father, as we go through this service. Help us, Father, to overcome fears. Always look to you. Always keep you in mind. For we know, Father, that our ultimate goal is to be with you. We know that the world gives us many things to think about. But, Father, let us always continue to keep, keep you in our center focus and keep your, our thoughts of you. Because doing that, we will get through and be with you in the end. Forgive us, Father, when we fail to do the things that we all do. Help us, Father, to always study. Help us to gain the knowledge and the wisdom that we need so that we can spread your word to others. Forgive us now as we go through the rest of the service. We pray through Christ. Mark the books to number 915. 915 will be the song after the lesson. Trust and obey. Uh, the song before the lesson, number 443, is the precious book. setting in a park there in the mountains in 
Panama. And the, you know, down in the, at that time in Central America, they just didn't have uh, running hot water. And I guess they still don't have running hot water, except maybe in some of the more luxurious places. Most places just have running cold water in the houses and the buildings and things like that. So, so we were in this, uh, this park building, which is kind of doubled as a uh, sort of a lodge, I guess you could say. And we were spending the night here. Of course, they only had cold running water, no hot running water. Well, what happens the next morning after everybody has slept all night on the floor? It was necessary to uh, bathe someone. Everybody wanted to bathe, but we only had cold water. It was cold in the mountains, and the water was cold. And so there in the mountains with the water coming out of the, there was no shower head on the shower, there was this stream of solid water you know, coming out. <laughs> uh, ducking your head underneath that cold water in the morning for a few minutes just to kind of uh, lather up and, and, and get clean was an exhilarating experience, you know, to put it in a very nice way, right? Um, and that got me to thinking about the extremes of the Bible. You know, there's, the Bible has some extremes in it. There is value to moderation, and moderation is what we need to be practicing uh, at most times. But sometimes the Bible talks a very extreme language, <laughs> and in this extreme language, we are hearing God communicate to us what His priorities are. And He puts it in terms that we can understand and in extremes so that we can understand. So it will be clear to us, very clear to us, what God thinks. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, you know, Paul is talking about his story here. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, but he gave all that up so that he might know Jesus. Look at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection and fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So Paul had a life before he became a Christian. We read about that life somewhat in the book of Acts, but he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He talks about all the various things that he was. And yet, when Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus and uh, basically explained to him who he was, and Saul realized very quickly that he needed to change he didn't hold anything back. He went forward and he took the necessary steps that he needed to take to follow Jesus. And so he said, all of those things that I once valued, I count them as trash. Why? So that he might know Christ or gain Christ. Some would say, well, that's very extreme action, you know, on the all of on the part of Apostle Paul. But I don't think it's uh, unreasonable that when God tells us to go to extremes, that we, uh, it's not unreasonable that we follow. Right? Because God is saying, this is what I want you to do. A lot of times, what seems unreasonable to us only seems unreasonable because the world is doing something else, right? And they make it look unreasonable. There's an interesting quotation from a 
Maybe many of you may know the author uh, C.S. Lewis, who was a very good Christian apologist and uh, wrote a number of books, a number of children's books. Even. One of the things he said is this, when everyone else is running off the cliff, the person running in the opposite direction looks like he's lost his mind. You know. Well, who's being unreasonable, right? The person who's running away from the cliff or the person who's running toward the cliff, right? And we know what the answer is to that. But from the perspective of everyone else, it looks like the one who's running away is unreasonable, right? And so as we think about what God is telling us in these passages that we're going to be looking at in a few moments where, where extremities are discussed, um, we should consider that. We should keep that in mind that God is actually the one who is reasonable and that it is the world that makes the reasonable look unreasonable. Well, let's talk about the extreme Jesus for just a moment, having said a few introductory things. Jesus had some extreme things to say from time to time. One of those things he discusses in Luke chapter 13 and verses 3 and 5, he makes this statement twice. And in making this statement, he lets us know that there are some extremes that need to be considered. He says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So look at the extreme. There is on the one hand to perish or to die or to uh, be destroyed. On the other hand, there is repentance, change, uh, making choices that take us in the opposite direction in which we are currently going right now. Repentance. You know, repentance is extreme action. Repentance is a, a 180 move, right? You go in one direction and then you have to turn around and go the opposite direction. That's an extreme decision. Repentance is a change of mind that results in the reformation of life. And Jesus, in talking about repentance, calls us to making this decision. God certainly wants folks to repent. They want to have a penitent mind, a penitent lifestyle. But to the world, that seems kind of extreme. You know, you're not going to participate in our party over here? You know, with all the, the sin that's going on at this party? No, I'm not. Well, you're, you're really crazy. You're extreme. You know, everybody does this. You're not going to participate in in uh, the the you know sort of the various different uh, religious programs that happen from time to time, you know, in the community where where everybody comes out in a in a big way, you know, to sort of sort of affirm some kind of, of religious unity, which isn't really unity, but that's a pretense to unity. No. Well, you've gone to an extreme. You're, you're the extremist. But repentance demands that we remove ourselves from situations where God would not be happy. And the world does not have that restriction. The world does not put that uh, limitation on their behavior, right? The world says, hey, we wherever we want, whatever we want, however we want. And the Bible says, no, wait a minute. God is calling you to a different way of living. An extreme way of living in comparison to the way that the world lives. Jesus represented this, I think, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 and 30. One of the extreme passages, extreme sayings of Jesus. He said, if thy right hand or thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it far from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. 
If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Well, was Jesus, Jesus literally talking about you know, self-mutilation? I, I don't think that's what he was discussing here. But he was saying that you need to take the necessary steps, however extreme they might be, to ensure that you remove sin from your life. You, know, you don't want sin dominating your life. You don't want sin controlling your life. And in that regard, there is nothing too precious in this world that is worth hanging on to if it means that we will be continuing in a sinful situation. And that, that's what Jesus is getting at. You know, Jesus died an awfully extreme death so that we might have the forgiveness of sins, right? That cross was an instrument of punishment and torture designed to dissuade criminals from doing their uh, evil deeds. And when you looked on that cross and somebody some, saw somebody suffering there and dying there, you were going to think twice of taking that uh, action that might be against the, the Roman state, you know, because that was a deterrent, that was a dissuader for criminals is what it was designed to do. It was a, it was a deterrent, it was a dissuader uh, against rebellion, against the Roman government. <laughs> and so they intentionally went to extremes in order to prevent insurrection. When Jesus died on that cross, it was an extreme death. The whole story is Jesus went to the cross willingly. Yes, the Romans put him there, but he went there without contest, knowing that God had a greater purpose in mind, the salvation of mankind, you see. But sin takes us to extremes. And so another extreme had to be utilized in order to deal with the extreme problem of sin. And so Jesus went to that cross. The Bible says that God commends His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Two extremes. The extreme of being a sinner, the extreme of being God in the flesh. And yet, in going to those extremes that God went to in order to save us, He was then able to bring us back from the extreme of eternal separation from Him. Extreme measures to deal with sin. God took extreme measures to deal with sin. Jesus expects extreme dedication in His disciples. We just talked about the cross and, and what it meant. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26, we read these words. Then Jesus said to His disciples, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for My sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall make him exchange for his soul? Here's, here's two extremes, right? There is, on the one hand, going to the nth degree to gain the whole world, right? And, and working toward that end. And, and a lot of people have that in mind, you know, that they're going to work so that they can earn money and they, they can earn this money so they can get things and they can get things so they can enjoy life and they can enjoy life because they're going to live forever. And this idea that a lot of people think they don't think about dying and death and, and eternity and things like that. But Jesus is saying, wait a minute, put the brakes on that for a second. 
and think about what all that entails. The extremes of going to have going to work for you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, however many hours a week. The extreme of having to protect all of those things in, in a lot of different ways. The extreme of somehow managing to hang on to those things and all the work that goes into keeping up with all of those things. If you think about it, you know, that's, that's what the world thinks is normal behavior. But to those people living in the first century who, who would have had any of those things, they would have looked at that and said, y'all are crazy. <laughs> doing all that stuff just to maintain it. And uh, they would think, how do y'all how do y'all live that way? You know? uh, they, they, they didn't do things like that. But even in that culture, Jesus said, we, we do the things that we think need to be done in order to preserve life, to save our life. And we go to uh, extreme measures to do that because we believe that's important. But Jesus is saying, look, you really don't need to do that because I can do it so much better than you can if you will trust me to do it. And then, instead of losing your life in the pursuit of all of those things, you will save it and life will actually be pretty good and you will actually have the abundant life, like he says in John 10, verse 10. And in having that abundant life, you will then experience peace, love, joy, all of these wonderful things that God gives along with it. But you gotta, you've got to uh, give your life to Christ first, and wholly and fully and completely. He doesn't want just part of you, he wants all of you at all times. How do we know that? Because Jesus gave Himself fully at all times. He gave all of Himself on the cross. And He didn't stop that process until His life was done. Paul talks about this life in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Faith which is in the Son of God who loved me and gave His life for me. And by the way, Jesus expresses this in Matthew chapter 8, verses 20 and 22, 21 and 22. Another one of those extreme passages. And another of His disciples said to Him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto Him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Where do our loyalties lie? Is it with God and Christ or is it with other things? Whether those things be, you know, the physical things we talked about, or whether they even be family ties or family members. Even those ties must come under the dominion of Jesus Christ. He said, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister and had his own life also, he cannot be my disciples. Luke 14, verse 26. He expects us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. And he wants us to present our bodies as living sacrifices. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Extreme dedication in His disciples. Jesus is asking us to go to extremes for Him. And then there is this. Extreme love for one another. Extreme love. You know, the world, the way the world acts, you, you love so much, there's, there's a point at which you stop loving somebody, right? You know, have you ever experienced this, that uh, someone will 
uh, come into your life and you'll seem to get along really well and then you'll also say something that, that uh, bothers them and all of a sudden, wham! You know, there's a wall. There's a door that's been closed. And now the relationship is distant. Why is that? Because people don't really love others to the degree that God loves us. They, they don't go all the way in their love for one another. What are they afraid of? Many things. They're afraid of controversy. They're afraid of disagreeing. They're afraid of, of getting hurt. There may be a number of things. Fear of rejection, fear of failure. So many different fears out there. You know, the world of the dictionary is full of those things you can look up. And so, love only goes as far as fear, right? And as soon as the fear kicks in, the love kicks off. The love turns off. Well, that isn't Bible love. You know, love that Jesus commands goes all the way. It keeps going. It doesn't stop. It doesn't let fear hold it back. And that's the kind of love that we need to have for one another. Not the fear of a relationship uh, having problems or, or going south or something like that, but rather the idea that you know, whatever happens, I'm going to love this person. I'm going to have a relationship with them. At least that's my attitude. I understand the relationship is a two-way thing. And it takes the other person to meet you there, obviously. But as far as my attitude is concerned, I'm in for the full relationship as God has permitted and as He has defined that relationship you know, in His holy and divine Word. And I'm not going to hold back. I, I'm, I'm going to go as far as the other person wants to go with that relationship. Now, that doesn't mean I'm, I have all the time in the world or anything like that, nor does it mean you do either. But it does mean that I'm not going to slam the door in someone's face. I'm not going to cut them off. I'm not going to build walls. And I'm not going to give up hope that that relationship can be better as I continue to love another person and I continue to reach out to them and encourage them to uh, love me back, you know, in the way that God has set forth those things. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 43 through 48, Jesus says this, You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For He makes His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors the same, and if you salute your brother only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? You therefore be perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect or complete, is the idea there. In other words, love in a complete way, not in a limited way. Love in a way that's going to embrace other people in your life and invite them to come in. And that's how I want to love other people, and I hope that's the way you want to love them as well. And so, when we love, we go, we're, we're willing to go to the extreme, into things, loving even our enemies, praying for them, even when they are maybe not thinking well of us. This is Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as is in you, live peacefully with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, said the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him something to drink. For so good, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. 
So loving our enemies. Loving those who uh, have no interest in returning that love to us. Extreme, yes. But an extreme that is worth pursuing. The truest test of our love is not going to occur when things are going well. You know, things are going well. It's easy to love other people, right? That's that's the time uh, when, yeah, everything's going great. You're good. I'm good. We're having a good time. I love you. You know, you're you're a great person, uh, and that's wonderful. And, and and that's that's good. You know, that's that's all right. But what's your attitude when you are things are not going well? You know, when your your friend steps on your foot, or you have a disagreement with your brother or sister. They have something that you want. You have something that they want. You don't want to share that with them or whatever. Or you know, as adults. When you're competing for a position in the workplace or something like that, or dealing with other people's money, and people get jealous of those things, and maybe one of your friends is one of those kinds of people, you know, um, do you love even in those times? Listen to what Peter has to say in 1 Peter 3 and verses 17 and 18. He says, What is better? If the will of God be so, that you suffer for well doing than for evil doing. For Christ also had once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, to put, uh, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. What happens when a brother treats me wrong? Or there's a disagreement even in the church? which things take place from time to time. Do we encourage the spirit of love to prevail? Is that where our mindset is? What are our thoughts in those situations? Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love is brother, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that you are there to call that you should inherit a blessing. 1 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. It's so easy to want to take a different approach sometimes and instead of loving other people, turn them into our enemies and fight. You know, Oh, we get all kinds of rationalizations for fighting, right? We can justify it to the cows come home. I'm right, he's wrong. This is mine, it's not his, you know. All kinds of things can happen in that regard. Does love supersede all of our other attitudes in those situations? Think about 1 John 3, verses 16 through 18. Hereby we perceive the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's goods and sees his brother have need and shuts up his, his compassion from him, how does the love of God live in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Sometimes our love is stretched the most when it's others who are in need and, and we have things and, and the opportunity is there for us to help and we start to look at what we have and we decide we don't want to share. Do we love in moments like that? When others really need help, I hope we do. We're reminded in Hebrews 13 and verse 16, but to do good and communicate or to share, do not forget. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. The extreme Jesus, he went to extreme measures to deal with sin. He expects extreme dedication from his disciples. 
wants us to show extreme love for one another. Are we going to the extremes? For the sake of Jesus Christ. He certainly went to the extremes for us. And giving His life on the cross that we might be forgiven of our sins. And when He was raised from the dead, God gave Him all authority. And He came forth and He said, Go in all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. It's another extreme. All the world, you know. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. There's another extreme, not a condemnation. Are we doing what Jesus wants us to do with our lives? Maybe there's someone here tonight who, who needs to take the extreme step, turning their back to the world and facing the cross and listening to the message of Jesus Christ. Hear His Word. Hear His message. Believe it. Repent of your sins. Confess Him as Lord. Be baptized so that you can be forgiven of sins. Come out of darkness into light. And start living for God and Christ each and every day. The world takes us to extremes. God wants to bring us back into this fellowship of love, and mercy, and grace. So this evening, if someone has a need to do that, we invite you to come forward right now. While you we stand before we start.
Continue our thanks now for this cup of fruit of vine, which represents your son's blood that was shed on the cross and the acid. You'd be the one to take this cup at this time and tell this old man to please you know the Christ's name we pray. Father, that you forgive us of our sins. Give us a good 